West Virginia, riding mama, choo choo doo doo waters. Life is dusty, dusting in the sky, dusting in the moonshine, too dropped in my eyes. Country roads take me home to the place where I belong. West Virginia, riding mama, take me home. Country roads take me home. Country roads to the place. Where I belong, West Virginia, riding mama, take me home, country road. Oh, good gravy, that was awful. <laughs> yeah, not exactly mountain music to my ears, but one thing that had to be a sweet sound for West Virginia fans, the sound of hearing your team having a double-digit winning season, which last year the Mountaineers did, okay? It was it was a real good year for Dana Holgerson's team. Ten wins, only three losses. Their best season since joining the Big 12. They've been a member since 2012. 7-2 and two in Big 12 play were the Mountaineers. And for the most part, the defense held their own against the competition in league play. And the offense was balanced all year long. Great formula for having a 10-win season. Now, to keep the momentum going, Dana Holgerson, the head coach, knows that his team must again get good quarterback play. Because I thought Skeller Howard did a good job for the Mountaineers the two years he was there, but he's moved on. So enter former Florida quarterback Will Greer. Now, just in case you don't know, two years ago, Greer, as a Florida Gator, played six games and won all six as a starter. As a matter of fact, only threw three picks during that six-game span. But before the LSU game, devastating news for Florida and for Greer that Greer was going to be suspended for PED issues, and he never played for the Gators again. In fact, didn't play last year at all for anybody so he's been out of action for a year and a half as far as competitive football goes. And the reason why I held off on doing my West Virginia report uh, this late was because I wanted to find out if the NCAA was going to give their clearance to where Greer could play as early as week number one. And the NCAA uh, gave a thumbs up on that. So Greer will be available all year long. A big relief for Mountaineer fans and definitely uh, for Will Greer another opportunity uh, to show what he could do. And he's got the footwork. He's got the intangibles. Um, his decision-making is, is terrific. But the thing I like about Greer the most, his quick release. Gets rid of that ball, rapid fire in a hurry. The ground game around him could be the best in the Big 12 um, as far as returning talent and production. you got Justin Crawford, nearly 1,200 yards rushing a year ago, over seven yards per carry, including that monster game he had against Oklahoma last year where he rushed for over 300. Now, Kennedy McCoy also returns, saw plenty of touches his true freshman year back as a sophomore. And speaking of a uh, freshman, a true freshman named Tevin Bush from the New Orleans, Louisiana area, he could be a part of that three-back rotation now that Russell Shell has moved on. That's the good news for West Virginia. Optimism at quarterback and experience backfield. Fortunately, Receiving-wise, you lost your two best targets, including Shelton Gibson. He was one heck of a receiver, and he also, too, was a kick and putt returner, and you lose the Kiel Shorts as well. So, having to pick up the slack for West Virginia at the wideout, you've got um, Karan White, leading returning receiver. Um, he had, in 2016, um, almost 600 yards receiving and 48 receptions. Hopefully, he's okay, because late last year, broke his right leg against Iowa State. And also back, you have Jovan Durant and David Seals. Now, Seals is an interesting story for the Mountaineers because, you know, he always wanted to be a quarterback, okay? You might remember him from not too long ago when he had a terrific game in that bowl win over Arizona State. Last year, though, um, transferred and played community college ball in California, but now he's back and willing to accept his role as a receiver for the Mountaineers. He'll play the inside receiving spot. Now we got to chit chat about the offensive line. This has got to be the biggest area of concern entering this year if you are a WVU fan. You lose three starters, including two damn good ones, the All-American center, Tyler Olosky, as well as the left guard, Adam Pankey. But talk about what they do head back um, for a little bit of good news. Kyle Bosch, uh, the veteran who was right guard, they're going to move him to left guard. But the Mountaineers are not going to tinker at all with the right tackle position. Colton McKibbitts will remain there. Don't be surprised if a guy by the name of uh, Kelby Wickline breaks into the starting rotation. Now, Wickline does have Oklahoma ties, played his high school ball at Stillwater, uh, played junior college ball in Mississippi just recently, 
and flip-flopped, who was going to be a North Carolina Tar here entering this year, but decided to go to West Virginia instead. He's going to play for his dad, Joe Wickline, who was the offensive coordinator for the Mountaineers last year. Now Joe will be the offensive line coach. And speaking of offensive coordinator, you got a guy by the name of Jake Spadaball. You know, he was once a coach at West Virginia, specializing in QBs a few years ago, and really responsible for the development of uh, Geno Smith. Now, this time he comes back to West Virginia as an offensive coordinator. And get this, Dana Holgers is not going to be calling the place. It's going to be Jake Spadaball, and that's going to be something for a change. And who knows how long that will last. But Spadaball, for the moment, has the reins as far as calling the place. Mountaineers, like I said, were a balanced O in 2016. We're talking about 257 yards through the air and 228 on the ground. That balance must continue for Will Greer and the West Virginia offense to be very effective. Defensively, they have the 3-3-5 look. And for Tony Gibson, last year he knew that they were going to be raw at linebacker and experienced up front. This year, it's just the opposite. The defensive line is fairly new. In fact, they lost all three of the starters. So, need to put pressure from the ends. Adam Schuler as well as Reese Donahue. The pressure will be on them to get pressure after losing um, their all-everything defensive end in Noble, the Wachiku. As far as the linebackers, a little bit of a better feeling about this area than last year. Because you have two of the three back, Al Rashid Benton, the leading returning tackler for the Mountaineers, 80 stops a year ago. And at the weak side linebacker, you have David Long. As far as the secondary goes, well, you got to remember last year, you know, West Virginia knew what it was like to have to replace, you know, terrific talent. They had to replace both safeties. Entering this year, there's a lot of talent to replace as well. But what you have coming back is Kaiser White, who will play that spur position. And even though these guys didn't play last year for West Virginia, they do have experience. Talking about the free safety in Drayvon Askew-Henry, who had a terrific 2015, but we didn't see him at all last year because of a major injury. So hopefully he's ready to go for the Mountaineers this year. And you have uh, Corey Winfield, two-year starter at Syracuse, a transfer, playing his final year for the Mountaineers. He'll be at a corner spot. Safeties, I don't feel too bad about for West Virginia. I think they'll be okay. But the corner, again, not quite as experienced as far as West Virginia ties go. Mountaineers, a year ago, were fantastic. 24 points per game, which was second best in the Big 12. And they held their own against everybody in the league, except, of course, for Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, who had substantially higher point totals. As far as special teams, you have experience there with uh, Mike Molina. Made 68% of his kicks, and the punter is also back in Billy Kinney. Biggest concern you need to have if you're a Mountaineer fan is being able to return kicks and punts because in this area, they didn't even rank in the top 100 in the country in either category. Let's highlight the Mountaineer schedule for 2017. You might remember last year, West Virginia played a game at Landover, Maryland, and beat BYU. This year, Landover MD is the home opener for WVU as they'll play Virginia Tech. These two teams used to play each other in the Big East Conference. Now, the Big 12 opener is on the road against Kansas, which should be a layup. That's in late September, and you have two weeks to prepare for TCU, which obviously would be an opponent upgrade. you got to play them in Fort Worth. That could be trouble. Look at the last five games of the season for West Virginia. Although three of them were at home, four of those games, you can rest assured that the Mountaineers are going to have their hands full. Oklahoma State will be loaded. That will be late October. At Kansas State in mid-November, the following week, against a Texas team that should be much improved. And you close out the year on the road in Norman against the two-time defending league champion Sooners. Ouch. The Vegas win total, well, they're not too optimistic about West Virginia. They've got them winning only six. I'm going to be a little bit more optimistic and say seven. I think the quarterback play again will be fine for West Virginia, even though it's a new guy at the helm. And Will Greer. Again, I think West Virginia fans will like him a lot. And the ground game should continue to be effective and will be even more effective if the offensive line develops fast. Defensively, though, again, they're going to be a little bit raw at the corner spot and the defensive line will be in the same position as well. West Virginia will have a winning year and go to a minor bowl game, but will fall off the mountain a little bit as far as the win total. It won't be a 10-win season like they enjoyed last year. That's my look at West Virginia. See you next time.